Hello, I'm Neil Romanek, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Feed Magazine, and welcome to Feed's uh, live broadcast roundtable. And uh, we, are, we have some great guests today, Tim Felstead, Craig Mor Merle, Craig Merle, and, uh, and John Williams. Uh, and we're going to get into uh, kind of the state of live broadcasts as it is kind of post-pandemic, and what some of the challenges are, and kind of some of the opportunities, uh, and how to be more efficient and stretch your stretch your dollars or pounds or euros uh, to do better live broadcast and reach more people. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to introduce yourself first, and then we'll jump right into the conversation. Tim? Thanks for the invitation, Neil. Uh, my name's Tim Felstead. I work for Sony, uh, who I won't introduce further. I think we're well known enough. Um, my own experience is most of my career in, uh, in live production on the supply technology side. Uh, at the moment, I'm a, uh, a marketing manager for live production in Sony, covering Europe. Everything from um, physical signal processing to control systems to um, cloud solutions to but in in the past and in other uh, parts of life i've looked after uh, delivery systems play out encoding multiplexing so pretty well-rounded technologist and very interested in this conversation so that's me great craig i'm craig merle i'm the managing director at groovy gecko uh, 60 second intro intro to groovy gecko um Groovy Gecko has been going about 22 years now. We're one of the pioneers in the webcasting and streaming space in the UK and, and Europe. Our clients are anybody from very large companies like BP and big banks, all the way through to pharmaceuticals, uh, broadcasters like Channel 4 and BBC, and then all the way through to agencies and uh, big brands, FMCG, car brands, uh, lifestyle brands, and then um, parliaments, we do stream for UK and Scottish parliaments. And then we partner very, very frequently with production companies, large and small as well. Um, our flagship pro product is called Echo Enterprise, which is an enterprise um, um, media uh, platform. And that was used to very good effect over the pandemic, where it was also used for large, super secure and super scalable virtual conferencing. We obviously have professional services where we actually go out and do the actual um, uh, webcasts. Uh, and then uh, we do a lot of stuff in uh, social media. We were actually launch partners for Facebook Live and Facebook 360 many years ago. Um, so we've, we've been around. And I also head up R&D uh, at uh, Groovy Gecko. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's me and Groovy Gecko. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Very pleased to be here. Great, John? Um, hello, all. Um, yeah, thanks also for the invite. Um, John Williams, Director of Media Services and Facilities for Gravity Media. Um, so I'm responsible for the sort of projects, fly packs, outside broadcasts uh, element to the EMEA business. Um, and we also do systems integration, um, the you know, post production uh, facilities, all sorts uh, in, the, sort of in this region, but across the world, we have based in LA, Melbourne, Sydney, um, Germany. France, uh, Qatar, uh, and we do end-to-end -end facilities basically from acquisition, on-site production, so the entire production chain, uh, all the way through to post-production, delivery, studios, etc. on the other end. Um, so yeah, it's a it's an amazing place to work, and um, yeah, thank you for inviting again. Great, thanks. Um, well, we can just kind of get into. I mean, with you know the the pandemic, the pand pandemic was a time when. A lot of live broadcast was forced to shut down and people had to start to get kind of creative about live broadcast. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it seemed like it, that people actually in some ways started to do more streaming of different kinds during the pandemic. Uh, and the appetite for streaming grew among audiences, certainly. And people had to maybe start thinking about things or getting creative in a way, you know, they hadn't, they hadn't before, they weren't, hadn't been forced to. Um, and now we're sort of back and it seems like there's, seems like there's a new awareness of the possibilities of streaming. Uh, and broadcast kind of across sectors, whether it's in news or sports or corporate or or education, um, but uh, but also it's you know today is 2022 is not 2019. There's like there's a lot of new challenges. Um, COVID is still with us. Uh, the economy is certainly interesting out there. Um, the amount of CO2 we're putting in the atmosphere is going up every day, and we've got to make some radical changes in everything we do to sort of you know because we're running out of runway to to 
to make an to effective change in that area. So, so there are a lot of challenges around. Um, and I guess maybe the first question I'd ask uh, ask you all to, you know to get us started is how have you seen your customers? Um, uh, I guess, you know, sort of coming out of the pandemic and getting, in a way, rebooting maybe the live broadcast, whether it's television or streaming or, uh, you know, whatever it is they're doing. Um, how have they changed what they've done or how has their thinking changed over the past couple of years, whether it's affected by the pandemic or just even the technology or business? How, how, what changes have you noticed uh, in how your customers are, have been thinking? Um, John, do you, want to, do you want to start with that? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I suppose it's Obviously, during the pandemic, everyone was in lockdown, working from home. The, the buzzword of the remote production and virtual service all of a sudden just that just ramped up massively. It was, there was a, yeah, it, the engineering technical teams in the background were like just run flat out, just trying to come up with new ways of working. And that is the bit that is really sort of carried on post pandemic, as such, for want of a better phrase, because as I say, it's still here. Um, so in terms of the live production, we're still doing the facilities on site, but the remote studio operations, remote monitoring, remote commentary, all of that element is still in place. Um, and you know, it's just been a, it's been quite an interesting sort of experience as, as sort of the world's woken up again and people have been able to travel, how different some production departments have gone, actually, let's just go, let's just get back on site, get back to how it was, and um, really start get, building up the atmosphere and or what they've missed so much from being stuck at home. Um, whereas others are, no, we've gone from the sustainability approach and we're gonna look at it from this angle now. We don't need to fly all these people. We don't need to ship all that kit. Um, and that's goes into other things well, like just freight at the moment is still absolutely crazy. You can't move kit or people around very easily mm. still. Um, so that element of, yeah, yeah so the, sort of the production, well, I'm trying to think of, the, 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 the nice creative end of it is now still fairly spread out be it in our studio facilities or at home or the different ways of working, whereas the core technical crew is still going on site and, and we're still building those facilities for that part of it. Do you think that those uh, those teams that are like going, hey, we're back, we're going to go back and, you know, we're back in action, do things the way we used to do, hooray, are they, they going to stay like that? Or, or do you think that there's going to be some... Uh, uh, some backpedaling from that? Uh, if the world continues trying to stay away from the politics of that whole, but if the world continues uh, in this kind of fashion, I think budgets will be squeezed so far that they'll go back the other way. You know, it's just, um, I sort of alluded to the, the freight and logistics charges of moving kit and people around at the moment. It's just, um, it's eye watering still. And I, and I can't really see any end in sight in that one at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I think the economics, I, I echo that, John. I think the economics are that, uh, you know, when, when the client realizes what they can get at a different price point, they're going to automatically make an assessment of whether they should pay top dollar for top production values or whether they're prepared to compromise for something that is perfectly acceptable and has gone down a storm, but at a completely magnitude uh, changing um, price point. So I think we're being led by the market on that one. Um, also, we've got a, a, we've got a mix of attitude in our clients. Some of them who used to want us on site now still, you know, still want us to be on site from a risk mitigation point of view, whereas others are happy that the remote and dual path, you know, solutions that we've put in place, they don't need us to be there because they've got a policy of their own that they rather work, have people working remotely. So I think it's, uh, we're being led by the market at the moment. And as long as we can stay flexible and provide the old school way of doing things, uh, as well as a new regime of, of, of attitude of doing things, I think that's us complying with the market and helping our clients make sense of things. Because from their point of view, having an empathy for them, this is also a brand new world for them. You know, so it's it's tough to work out. We've just got to make sure that we are flexible. I do have to say some some of the sort of recent proposals and tenders we've, we've responded to, there is a strong remote production element to it to cut down on moving people, specifically now. Even to like the next the next level, so yes, they can move like the world feed or, or the domestic product production back to their home country. But now we're looking at ways that you can actually move the replay operators, the camera shaders or, or racking, whichever code you come from, um, and other operators back to a production center and really do that in an end to end sort of um, moving of signals back. But it's always the balance of 
the connectivity piece versus what you can move and what and, and how the actual technology works and integrates with everything. Hmm. Yeah, Tim, you question. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna ask because you've you've seen sort of things on the vendor side. So you know people are yeah, like a slightly different pair of glasses. Yeah. Um no the, the the thing I'd like to ask you two gentlemen is um is the change of human resource needs that have come across or come along over the last couple of years um you know the type and it's an ongoing process we've been in this path transformation for years now a decade more maybe i don't know uh, we could debate that um but the last couple of years in particular this emphasis on remote production on uh networking skills on skills that we didn't necessarily have in abundance in our industry before you know we've heard recently that the transformation that's required at the moment is a human transformation as opposed to a technology transformation i wondered what your perspectives were on that hmm. i can i can answer that from a uh, a sort of non big production point of view which i think john would more likely come from the, the fact that we are an internet based company, in other words, we're using PCs, we're using Ethernet, IP addresses, DNS, security, firewalls, we're in a much better position for our guys to be more flexible on what we need to do. Um, and I think, uh, you know, if I take something that's not as black as white as moving from, let's say, SDI to IP, but take something like Dante Audio, right, which I think a lot of uh, viewers will, will know uh, and understand. For us to move to Dante is a real issue, even though we are networking people, hmm. because before it, it, even I could actually unplug an SDI cable and plug it into another router, right? But if you're playing with Dante, you know, you you no longer you, you now you need network experts, you need IT experts to come and uh, and play with that. So, so I think uh, from our point of view, and I'm specifically using a, a, um, an example that, as I said, doesn't isn't as black and white as SDI IP. You know, it's it's an application level thing. So no matter what you're doing, you need to have that expertise. The way that we mitigate that risk is that we have redundancy and everything. So if our if our IP switch that's running Dante goes down, yes, we will probably lose some audio. But if the guys know and have been trained to actually take those cables out and stick them into another router that's actually a hot standby, we can mitigate that risk because you can't afford to actually then go and get an IT guy to come and troubleshoot your network. You're live on an event. So it's, it's actually understanding the problem and then coming up with real world um, practical solutions to mitigate, to mitigate that. Yeah. Um, you might have a different view because I think our tech and your tech is, is obviously, you know, very, very different in terms of scale and magnitude. Well, I think they're slamming into each other, but we can talk about that. <laughs> John, what, what, what were you going to say? I was just going to say they are yeah they are basically slamming into each other. The broadcast engineers now they have to have a level of skill in IP technology and, and switch configuration and uh, the, yeah, the whole DNS IP addressing and and the structure around uh, both like a control network and when we go into the IP workflows and sort of twenty one to ten uh, that is a whole other world of uh, pain in some situations because you have yeah you have to get all that configuration. Right, it's, as you say, it's not just a simple case of getting a BNC and a monitor, and you go, "Yep, that signal's there." Off we go. There's a whole world of configuration in the background that has to happen before you even think about doing that. Yeah, and then of course you've got in the world we live in today, you've got that extra layer of security. Everything that you have to do is based on security. So uh, we're we're we've been ISO twenty seven thousand and one based now for about four years, and it's been a real pain to do and it takes up so much time and it's expensive but it's completely transformed our attitude to doing business and the way that we can do business so it's all very well having a technical solution but you need to be led security first is our motto you know right. security first and everything above that um, because we have to get security right every day the guys trying to hack us only have to get it right once right. So, and that has a big impact obviously on the live event yeah. So, John, are you, um, because a, a lot of your uh, customers in the past have been, you know, you, you supply sort of big, you know, fly packs and OB trucks and stuff for, for yeah. big broadcasts in some cases. Have you seen that change or do you, do you, and do you see your customers being willing to rethink how they're going to be doing those broadcasts? And, and what are those conversations like? You know, when the case where they maybe a couple of years ago, they'd be like, yeah, we want this and we want this and this and that. Are you 
talking with them about how to make things more efficient, how to downsize, how to, to make this kind of move, not, not exactly to what Groovy Gecko is doing, but to start incorporating those different kinds of tools and different ways of thinking. Oh, always, really. You know, that's, that's what we're here for. We are with facilities provider, no matter which way you look at it, and we are here to facilitate production, be large, small, um, on the moon or in the desert, it doesn't matter. We, we'll try and make telly anywhere. Um, but long-standing contracts, that, that's part of the, we all try and have a production partnership as such, so you can always discuss new and emerging technologies, choices, um, and it comes back to sort of like the HR part of it. If we don't need to fly someone across the other side of the world, because technology now allows them to sit in their bedroom and configure a switch or set up workflows, then we'll do that part of it. But we have to also reassure the client that they're getting the same level of service of moving that person around and actually making sure they have that resilience in, in the forecast provision. But the, um, yeah, as I said, yeah, it's always an open conversation as sometimes you'll get a very prescriptive brief of we want boxes X, Y, and Z to turn up on this date. And sometimes you'll just get a few sentences saying, we'd like to produce a match or, or a show how would you do it? Yeah. So it's, it's all dependent on exactly what the client wants. I think from a, from a technology, from our technology, so, sorry, Craig, um, from our technology supply um, point of view, you know, we're, we're trying to support all of those uh, demands, you know, the, the needs for agility and flexibility and, you know, asset redeployment and operational efficiency. Um, so, at the same time as delivering SDI products where people do want something that is plug and play. Um, and we're, we're also developing uh, cloud solutions and everything in between. Um, but the most critical part seems to be uh, the management layer to enable that flexibility and those operational models that seem to change from or can change from day to day um so you know john i guess correct me if i'm wrong but you get clients walking in the door with different well both of you actually craig as well get clients walking in the door in the door with different demands on a daily basis and as a technology vendor we're trying to enable uh, anything, any uh, business model, op any operational model that uh, that might walk in through the door using appropriate technology. Yeah. So, so here's here's the practical example for you, Tim, and and and, and probably also a challenge for you. Um, uh, I mean, no doubt, you know, when it comes to us, I mean, we've got about a hundred thousand pounds worth of production equipment in the office, 4K stuff. We we hardly ever use it because we'd rather partner with a production company who can help us with a particular kind of job, which will have particular kind of requirements because the, the, the diverse nature of what we do is, is, is huge. Um, so, so John's and, and his crews are always gonna be able to provide better quality equipment for us. However, when it comes to remote uh, working for somebody in their office or in their room that needs to be an essential uh, key opinion leader or contributor, what we're, what we're doing is, uh, is sending them out what we call a care package. So this will be a 4K, this will be a laptop with a 4K camera and separate sound and mic uh, attributes. We remotely control, we, we remote into the machine. It's very easy to set up. All the cables are color coordinated. Even, even I can set it up. Uh, and these guys switch it on and we talk them through it. And the great thing about that is because they are in their own environment, they feel very settled. We take as long as we need to onboard them. We call it a white glove service. Onboard with them, rehearse with them. Because at the end of the day, what we want is the tech to be completely seamless. We want the talent and the, the message, whatever that is, to shine. And the only way you do that is to make the tech invisible. And for an individual who's not tech savvy, that's just making them comfortable, setting them up, encouraging them, telling them you know, what's working and what isn't. But the, the, the tension that we're having is although we could do that, we've mastered that technique and, and the, the, the production values are, are really appropriate to what we're doing. We're never going to be able to meet what John and his crews are doing. We're never going to be able to meet, let's say, an 8K camera, but we probably wouldn't need that. So the challenge to our, in our ecosystem, because we always look at this as an ecosystem sort of thing, is to, is to challenge hardware manufacturers like Sony and also software manufacturers to say, what can you guys provide us to get us to the next level? 
we're never going to get to John's level where we've got a jib operator and, a, you know, four sound engineers in this guy's bedroom. That's never going to happen. It's completely inappropriate. But I think there is space for us to actually go up to the next level. So, for example, I would love to be able to do a simple, just a two camera shoot. Now, for us to do that with a laptop is not easy. It's possible, but it's not easy. And again, it, from a risk point of view, it's, it's not nice. But I would love to have a two, a two camera PTZ from Sony that is in a cost effective, almost throwaway range that I can set these up um, and remotely control them. And, you know, the guy doesn't even have to do anything. All he has to do is unpack them and we help him position them. Uh, and the talent can just do that. But the, the, the thing is that you, the, I think the challenge is, is that we're moving away from budgets that, uh, you know, from a production, uh, sorry, a broadcast production budgets and production values to a streaming production value. And I think that's obviously the tension and the challenge to Sony and other manufacturers. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, we're a software manufacturer as well. Uh, so we, we write a lot of an awful lot of software. We've been writing cloud software for some, some years um, for different reasons. Um, sometimes it's, it's file-based asset management editing. Sometimes it's stream-based. Um, but at the same time, we're trying to service i think you 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 said the right word earlier which was um the different compromises that are, that are available or possible in some circumstances there is no compromise possible on certain aspects of a production like synchronous signal processing for instance or the quality of the image you know you have to deliver cameras that just sparkle i mean nothing nothing short will do so and then on top of that, um, you've got to make sure that the, the operational uh, facilities, the control surfaces and the deployment model that people want to use is also enabled. So putting the people in a different location to the processing and a different location to the event itself, all of those things have to be uh, enabled. But at the same time, being a, a sort of broad church uh, manufacturer, you know, we're looking, uh, we, well, we are, we are uh, using cloud solutions where different compromises are enabled. So, you know, the, the, the signal coming out of whatever device it is that you're using is encoded in some way. Therefore, the data rate is, you know, lowered and the, you know, whatever impact that might have on the image quality is down to the set of compromises that you talked about earlier. Craig, um, and uh, but then so many production models then become enabled that, that aren't possible when you're shifting, you know, enormous great streams and files around the place. So I think um, you know, so so covering all of these uh, these these possibilities is what Sony is trying to do with both software and hardware. And, you know, it, it, it's definitely a transition. You know, if, if someone wants to make a, a, an HDR 4K or an HDR UHD, let's say, uh, production, multi-camera at an event, very prestigious uh, event, lots of rights to be sold, they still want to use uh, over-the-top delivery technology to get that signal to people's mobile phones. So this is why I say we're, you know, our, our industries are clashing headlong. I mean, I think we've got a lot more to talk together about mm. than, than a, you know, we would have said three or four years ago. It's, it's accelerating, if anything else. Mm. So, but what about, mm. I'm sorry, go ahead, John. I was just going to say, it, it is sort of part of the sort of coming out of COVID that people are more open to trying new things mm. and more accepting of different levels of quality. And then they bring together yeah. the, the Zoom interviews and the sort of the people walking around mobile phones, but then they integrate that into a standard broadcast workflow. And it all just, it is, it's the, it's, yeah. it's knitting together really nicely at the moment. Yeah. I think, you know, we always try and look at what are the benefits to the end customer. Um, and, you know, from a practical point of view with COVID still hanging over our head and not, not pretending to go away anytime soon. If you do remote production, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to do venue recce. You don't need the venue clearances to do to do those records. You don't need to do logistics. You don't need to do RAMS documents, which are the bane of everybody's life, unless you have a team of admin people doing, 
you know, all of that red, red. So I think the benefits to, to having a, a remote facilities is definitely there. Nobody's mentioned the H word yet, which is hybrid. Um, I think, John, you were alluding to us moving into a world where we will start to have uh, those events will be coming back because, you know, human beings need to be with other human beings to do good quality business. But from a practical point of view, some people just won't be able to join. You know, if, you're, if your lead speaker has got COVID, it would be irresponsible for them, no matter what the rules of the country would be, for them to join that event. Mm -hmm. So bringing them onto stage, you know, and on, a, on, a, on a, a 4K screen and making them part of the, uh, you know, the original plan, is a, it's the only thing you can do. And that's, that's where we're heading to. It's having that flexibility to be able to, 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 to live in a hybrid world and, and make sure that you can offer your clients a price point that gives them that compromise between the production values, but also the ease and flexibility, because otherwise the event just won't happen. And that's not an option for a lot of people. And I wonder about cloud. You... Sorry, Sorry, Tim, I was, I was just going to ask about, about cloud, because Tim, you had mentioned cloud and, and you know, that uh, cloud is, is becoming an option for even you know, high end productions. And what what are the kind of the the real um, sort of efficiencies in cloud and being able to to we, and and, uh, and, and are are there cost savings or are there hidden expenses that that we that some people should know about? I need to take you to task a little bit because uh, I think the compromise word come should come into play again. Mm. Uh, the C word is 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 somewhat overused. Um, I think the uh, so people shouldn't have the impression there's only one answer you know life the universe and everything can be solved by cloud that's simply not the case um but what you've got to do is is uh use whatever technology is available for you to solve your problems in a in a more flexible agile and efficient way and i think the the c the c word cloud is is another set of technologies that enables other other modes of operation to be to be used so if you if you when you say cloud you're talking about uh remote connectivity for control systems or you're talking about um private networks and private data centers which are shifting huge amounts of real-time data different things they get wrapped up in this word that it becomes mm -hmm. all, all all knowing and all seeing and i think it's a it's a poor you know it's a it's not a good uh, a good use of the term it gives people the wrong impression um and, and the it's the it's the complexity of all of those potential solutions that i presume keeps john awake at night you know <laughs> client walks in the door and he's got this demand and that demand and he wants everything for nothing you know, and you go, how on earth, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, please, John, you know, <laughs> how, how on earth do I solve this guy's problem? And how I do it, how do I do it in an, an efficient and simple manner that humans can do it as to use Craig's point. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, John, if somebody comes into your office and says cloud, can, let's do cloud, 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 cloud. <laughs> what do you, what do you say to them? Call me. <laughs> <laughs> say, say call Craig. I'm really, I, yeah, I'm really sorry, I've sort of got, a, I lost you for a second there, really sorry. Oh, it's all, all, all right. Connection issues in the wonderful world that we live in now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I got the last bit about when someone comes in about cloud, so what was the question? Yeah, the, the question was, was um, you know, the, there's so much complexity in producing a solution for a customer. There's so many options and choices you've got all the way through from what source what how you're going to acquire signals to how you're going to treat the signal to therefore what sort of uh infrastructure you need to put in place to what sort of management systems i was just trying to you know pro ask you probe you you know how, how are you dealing with all that all those choices that you need to take care of um First thing, I, I don't really like the term cloud anyway, because it has too many meanings. Like what where, what do you mean by cloud? Is it the bare metal that's sat in my data center in, our, in one of our facilities? Or is it sat in AWS or Azure? It's like what what define cloud as such? And let's start talking about what virtualized service, what you can move. 
to us as a facilities provider, we just try and build um, services within our own clouds as such, really. Um, you know, we have you know, building our data centers and offices now because that is it's the way we see we can maximize our potential out of that. Um, in terms of someone walking through the door and saying, like, we want to use cloud, you then start going through a very sort of, you try just trying to harness or try and get as much of their deliverables out of them first, say, where do you want to get to at the end? Mm. Like, what, what do you want? And then you sort of work back from there and see what is achievable. And then we get into the money conversation and then it all goes horribly wrong. Um, but, so, uh, yeah. so from our point of view, uh, I mean, we, everything we do is in the cloud, right? It's by the definition. I also hate the C word. Um, I mean, you could say that we've been doing streaming in the cloud for 16, 17 years. When we first started, we were one of Akamai's very first you know, partners as a massive CDN, they're in the cloud. So we were doing that 16 years ago before anybody was going to use the word cloud. Mm. But for the same definition, we've, you know, we've got a, a backup Wowser server in our data center in our office. Well, that's cloud, whether it's private or hybrid cloud or whatever. I, it's, it's actually for us, it's not even a question that comes up. We don't have clients who come to us and, and ask the question about cloud. What they do is they have a business problem that they're trying to solve and they're looking for us to find a technical solution with them. And what we do then is we push back to them and say, is it really a technical solution that you want us to provide? Uh, and they say, yes, okay, well, let's ask some questions. What are you trying to get out of this event? Yeah. So we try to extrapolate everything away from a technology solution to understand what the client actually wants. If you understand what their business outcomes need to be, then we can map something that's appropriate technically onto that. Because what we're desperately trying to avoid is the whole done and one, you know, thing where we do a, a magnificent 8K production, everything. But, you know, their key performance indicator was that they wanted to add another 100 likes to their Facebook page. And we haven't been able to do that. So it doesn't matter how, how good you are technically, but if you don't understand what the client wants, um, it's, it's, it's pretty moot. One thing I would like to say on, in terms of using the internet, or let's use the word cloud, is that it's enabled us to, to scale up tremendously. Whereas before cloud, we used to, you know, if you wanted to go into, let's say, 50 or 100 pages in Facebook and Twitter and everything, we literally had to have those encoders sitting there in the MCR, taking that SDI feed in, splitting it out, and each one doing their thing. Now we use a uh, product GG Reflector, where we send a single stream up to the cloud, and we basically set up the configs, and, you know, we'll go to 100 channels, 100 pages instantaneously, plus backups, you know, we don't have the, you know, we've got multiple uh, one gig lines in our office, but there's no way that we could do 300 streams, you know, uh, at six meg each plus redundancy. It's just not going to happen without cloud. Um, so cloud definitely is an enabler for us, but it's not something that we talk uh, talk about. It's it's part of our solution. Mm -hmm. We are, sort of, we're, as a company, we are exploring different ways of doing it as much as possible. We are always, we're doing proof of concepts, we've got we're all going to come out soon. I'm not sure if you saw the one we did with ATP and AWS down our, our um base down in, in um Guildford, as far as I was there. Um, but uh, you've just got to try this technology and find something that is that is working, is reliable, it is actually going to save some money. It's not just going to just basically end up with a load of egress fees somewhere else down the line because you've still got to get it in and out of whatever system you do. Yeah. And then full circle, it just comes back to the, the conversation I had earlier in terms of the merging technology. You still need the broadcast engineer on site to plug up the cameras. But now they need to understand all this next level of where it's going and how that's configured. And yeah, have a greater understanding of the full end to end path now. It's not just a case of here's my BNC, off you go. Um, but I think that's a massive opportunity for, for, for Sony and other broadcasters as well. You know, uh, having those, we, we spoke about. Uh, cameras. Uh, we do. Cons we we've partnered on consulting with uh, encoding manufacturers who want to understand how we're using encoders in the field. And Tim, you mentioned control surfaces. It's all very well having something there, but if you can't control it, it's it's pretty pointless. So the challenge is really for Sony to provide us with kit that uh, you know obviously does the job at the right price point, but also has real time feedback. So we basically are. Uh, you know, I, what I want our guys, our engineers, I want them to have the confidence that when they click a slider on a hardware surface, control surface, you know, in the office, but they're actually controlling a remote machine, I want them to have the same experience and feedback, um, you know, as if they were actually sitting in front of that machine. That's the challenge. 
Um, we would really like to see that because then you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting the quality that Sony can provide, but you're getting the flexibility of us not having to actually physically be there on site. Yeah, that's the holy grail for us. And John, I'm sure you would agree as well. Because John, uh, to that percent. point, it it also takes out all that learning that that you're worried that you've just mentioned, you know, and different uh, skill sets and roles that those camera operators need to have. Yeah. So let's bump See, it up the line, up the up the value chain to Sony and challenge them to provide it for us. Well, there's, there's two elements that I would, that come to my mind. The first is the the control element, which is relatively relatively easy actually um making the the responsiveness of control signals over a network whether that's a very very wide area network or a local area network it's relatively straightforward because you're not shifting such high volumes of data but at the data plane where you're moving the media itself where you might have a, a physical distance between the signal processing the event and the people You've got to make sure the coordination exists between the control surface actions and what they're seeing on the screens in front of them. And there is technology. I mean, we we just, well, some of us, I didn't go, but some of us came back from NAB recently and we were showing um, encoding technology, which, which dramatically improves both quality and latency beyond what is available today, even though it has massively advanced over the last 10 years. So that particular train is still running. There's still a lot of development work going on to, into encoding technologies and control of latency and, and managing those, those timing uh, differences between what you can see and what you can touch. Um, so yeah, we, we, we're most certainly seeing the world uh, in the same way, Craig, and we're certainly working on all of those things constantly um and it's but it remains a challenge the yeah. sort of the kind of sort of slightly shift gears you i mean it's come up come up a few times that that you know that these technical you know you, people may come in and say they have a technology problem but really it's a business problem or it's uh or you know they they need to really rethink things from the business level not from the technology level so i, I wondered what kinds of things are you seeing in terms of um the I guess for a start, the, the different types of broadcasts that people are doing um, and maybe the platforms that they're playing out to. I know, Craig, you'll, you know, people will be playing out a lot to social, you know, but, um, you know, maybe there are also people are thinking about their own platforms, you know, that they want to point people to or there may be a broadcaster that's wants to do a parallel stream or, or a pop up channel or something like that. Just wondered what kind of things are you seeing where people are are trying to create kind of new revenue streams and new ways to reach audiences that they might not have tried before. Well, I mean, I, I don't know if you guys remember before the, the 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 pandemic, there was this wonderful buzzword going around called second screen. I mean, if you went to IBC or any of these shows, second screen for one of the years was one of the major themes. Second screen actually hasn't, you know, you know, really kicked off that much. And I, I would very much like to see a renaissance of the second screen. Um, because most people are now doing both. You know, they, they are watching TV as a family, as well as actually being on their same screen, their personal screen at the same time. So a number of years ago, I think probably about four or five, maybe six years ago, we did something for Coronation Street, where during the ad break, we were streaming live onto, onto um, you know, onto a page where people could interact, you know, uh, and then just, you know, and then we would tie that off from an editorial point of view, so that people could go back to the actual program. So once you've got that second screen, um, it's a it's a platform in itself. You can it's 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 a facilitator. It's a, you know it, it it can bootstrap pretty much anything you want to do. When you want to have Q and A, if you want to have private chats, you know between people, obviously there's uh, you know caveats to that. If you want to have uh, one of the talents, you know physically coming off the stage, you know on camera having those interviews and then you can see that person going back out and then literally going back onto the set if it was a live event i mean that is a fantastic thing to have you know so there are opportunities there for people that are bold enough have the right editorial and have the vision to take a chance um, and do those sorts of things because what i'm what i'm basically talking about here is innovation right you know same old same old is 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 just not going to cut it i mean that, that's why we love to work with digital agencies because they are challenged by their brands and their clients to keep doing something different. I want to be the first to do this. It makes headlines. 
Um, so we would like we would look to the ecosystem to say what is what can we pro what can we do here, both from the hardware manufacturers, but also from our production partners to say, look, we've got this challenge. We're doing Fat Boy Slim live. You know um, what we'd like to do is segue three cameras uh, backstage, as well as having two people that are competition winners in, you know, in you know in in Paris and in in Shoreditch to actually all contribute. Um, so again, it's not really about it's, it's, it's the tech is really important, but it's almost this needs to be business led or editorial led, mm -hmm. and everything comes from there. That's what gives us the challenge. Just being able to send something with. 10% less latency between point A and B doesn't excite me. But if that's got an application to, uh, you know, to save a huge amount of money and, and, and make an imp big impact, that's really interesting for us. Hmm. Yeah, John, have you, have you seen that? How have you seen um, your customers sort of rethinking about how they're, they're redistributing or distributing the content? There's more just that this, as always, it's this shoot once, use many, really, so there's man on it, and you just have the be it now different advertising and, and regional feeds and changing the boards around the side of a football picture or the back of the tennis court um, to different adverts and having um, a good Sony product that we can talk about that later actually by the way in terms of what the camera choice is for those, those outputs um, but uh, yeah just in terms of doing yeah, regional advertising um, be it nine by 16 all of a sudden that's, that's a, we've got to get into the Facebook world of how to do those and TikTok videos and yeah. just trying to all of the outlets covered from yes your main broadcast operation but then it, how it then integrates into your ott and your um your web teams and social teams and how you just get that full sort of 360 delivery on the 360 front you're then getting supplementary cameras and um inputs into the new sort of like the oculus and meta sort of side of things are doing um VR headsets so you, people can get the best seat in the house and they can choose which, which camera they actually watch the match from or watch the show from so hmm. that's that's the way they go from. So the, the sort of the core broadcast element is there. It's just the, the, the addition post that where it just goes on to the different platforms. You know, as long as we get the core right, everything else just fits in. Hmm. Tim, what have you what have you seen from from customers about that? How they're you know talking to you about tools and infrastructure and being able to kind of up to different platforms and was that to me? Sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, now, what was going through my mind when uh, John was talking just then is um, is there is um, a great deal of uh, there are a number of technology threads that came came to mind when that was uh, when John was talking, but it was related to the business objectives, as, as Craig was saying. Um, you know, the 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 uh, introduction of data. I mean, data for data's sake, into an entertainment system, um, in other, so that people can watch tracking data of players, for instance. This is an, another relatively recent development in our in our industry. Um, you know, the the introduction of five G services to enable like ultra mobile relatively good quality, relatively, and I re use these words carefully, relatively real-time media streams that can be used in second screen applications. You know, these are also uh, uh, technology developments that are enabling uh, different subscription models, for instance. People might pay for that second screen application. I mean, there are some industries that, uh, that are, doing such things already um, and also the the other thing that for instance formula one is a is a classic example but um and the uh yeah something else went through my mind you're gonna have to edit because <laughs> i forgot what i was gonna say um yeah but th th there is a, a significant clash of of uh, technologies that are there to enable business models and if it starts from that and people understand what the objectives are and what their uh, what the technology or how the technology needs to serve them. Hmm. I'll come back. I'll, uh, my brain will start working. Again. It's going yeah, but, in different directions. See same. if it comes back. The yeah. um, I mean, one one thing I, I come on again. We're we're kind of coming up towards time here, uh, but I wanted to get into you know something we'd mentioned at, at the beginning is this. Um, 
uh, you know, carbon footprint and being able to make changes that are necessary to, you know, to, to get to get to zero carbon, basically. And, you know, you can say there's lots of numbers like, you know, 2050 and things like that, which is, is much too late, I think, as we all know, <laughs> a lot of things have to happen very, very quickly. So there, you know, if it's going to happen, it's going to have to happen very quickly. And changes are going to have to happen quite quickly. So I wondered what kind of some of your your thoughts were about how to kind of make production and broadcast, uh, you know, get it down to zero carbon and what kind of sort of I mean, can there be and what kind of, you know, yeah, how, what bigger changes can be made? I, I can take that, Neil. Um, the, the thing is, this ties in very nicely with uh, lean effective production. Okay, because we all know that carbon footprint, carbon, carbon uh, emissions are generated when you move people and you move kit. So if you can cut down on those two things, you're, you're well on your way, right? Even if you're not, the, the, the objective here is not to be net zero, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that might be possible, but that's not the objective because somebody has to foot the bill for that and the client's budgets are squeezed anyway. So if you take a practical example, we recently did a live uh, webcast of Tom Holland for the launch of the Spider-Man movie. He was in LA in a studio and the journalists were in a movie cinema in Rome. Now to fly Tom Holland over to Rome was not going to happen. Okay, it's just talent, moving talent around was not going to happen. But even the footprint of that was, was astronomical. Um, flying our crew from London over to LA was also not an option. It's just too expensive. And, you know, a lot of that kit now is a commodity based sell, right? So you don't want to be spending money in carbon footprint on stuff that's commodity. Yeah. So we could rent that or use a local production partner. Or in fact, we're, we're actually going to open up an office there so that we can, you know, better facilitate that. Um, so that should be happening in the next quarter. But that's, that, that is a fine example of us being able to do a lean, effective production uh, of, of Tom as a hologram popping up on a stage at very, very low carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't fly anybody anywhere around the world. I mean, we used a local crew. It was, uh, you know, it's very, very efficient. And if you're being efficient, that means lower costs. That means either higher profit for you or a better relationship with you and your end client and what they try to achieve. John, what's that looking like for you? I as Chris said a second ago, that we do have the fundamental issue that we ship kits and people around the world to do major events or, or shows in a jungle, for example, but or, or out in in, um, in South Africa. But, but um it is a struggle and it's always it's always on our agenda to try and reduce that as much as possible but i don't think in the current and unless we do a fundamental shift in terms of like the production process and we move to the, the, the cloud-based operations and we try and centralize a lot of that resource within facilities or we change the production model where yes we set up a venue to do it and then but it sits there all year and multiple shows are done out there or we change it to a um a completely diverse model where yes you do the show in this place but everyone else stays at home it, there's, there's always going to be a piece of it that you're going to have to sort of give and take but, but, just, but john you're well on your way with that because you have so many existing offices around the world you know it's not like you need to fly somebody from london to to sydney right you have a sydney office so you guys are already, by the very nature of what you do and the size of who you are, you're already mitigating and uh, curtailing a lot of those carbon, um, you know, offsets anyway. Yeah, and we did we, we did it with, with more sort of COVID reason, but we, we did it with the Olympics. We had commentators in London, commentators in Melbourne, and not really many people in, in Tokyo. Uh, again, for the winters, we did the same. Um, we've done it for cricket, having analysis and commentary and analysis and commentators and other operators just at home or in the UK facility while everyone else was either in Windows or New Zealand. So it, there's always a way of, um, of trying to reduce that part of it, but yes. Hmm. We try and use whatever facilities we have as much as possible. Um, but yeah, it still gets to the point where you've got to get the cameras on site. Yeah, I was just going to say the same uh, or a related uh, semi-joking example where I, I was going to say, I know the answer for not shipping kit around, and that's buying three times more kit. But mm -hmm. I, I don't, but actually, that speaks to, I mean, the real answer is what you want to do is have, you know, use the minimum amount of shipping and the minimum amount of power. Um, and, and so, you know, some, it's very difficult with sensing equipment. You know, anything that's got a sensor on it needs to be where the action is. And if you want a special sensor that captures, 
you know, four, you know, six times or eight times speed at UHD, then, you know, you, you've got to send a, a special piece of equipment there. But there's many other things that can be uh, centrally located. And then it becomes a, a question of resource uh, efficiency. And, 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 the, and back to the management story where you, you know, how you do one job in the morning, which is one shape, and then another job in the afternoon, which is completely different, and shipping the minimum uh, amount of kit to two different sites and the minimum uh, number of people. I mean, that's a, that's a, it, it remains a, it remains a problem. I mean, as organizations, we can do things, you know, we can switch the lights off and make sure our air conditioning is not on all the time or design better buildings or drive different cars. But in the actual production process itself, the, you know, the, the, this business, um, you know, we're still, I think, developing those things. You know, so Sony, uh, you know, sustainability uh, for us also means sustaining our or helping to sustain our customers' business models. You know that whatever we make should contribute to a sustainable circumstance going forward. Um, you know, it's not. Uh, uh, you know, there's there's business elements there. If it's good for the planet, it's just generally good business. So sustainability sustainability is is very much central to to our mode of operation as a company. It sounds a bit a bit strange because we're a kit manufacturer. You know, but but that is that is quite fundamental. Um, yeah, I think we should all be doing. But but I mean, at the end of the day, the greenest events are going to be the ones that are completely virtual, right? Mm -hmm. No traveling, no room, no in-room audience, but still having the flexibility to be innovative, to bring the brand across, bring the brand forward, have huge options for reach and syndication. I mean, that's that's what it comes down to. Yeah, you have to make decisions along the production process, and it, and, it, and again, you just work with the producers of the programming and the federations or the site owners and you just make sure that whatever facilities you're providing comes from a certain source that has the right credentials they so you keep it on the chain and it's all about the supply and logistics, logistics chains and that we need other industries to join us in the journey to make it more sustainable and reducing air freight that's relatively easy that we can do that part of it because we just build in that time frame of sea freighting or supplying kit locally but we need to need other industries to sort of get on the bandwagon and move with us as well. Great. Indeed. Well, thank you so much, Tim, Craig, John. That was great. Um, there's a lot to think about there, and I think people are going to really enjoy that conversation. I can't uh, wait to hear what some of the reactions are and some of the feedback we get. Um, we look forward to talking with you again, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Pleasure to meet you guys. Likewise.